Let's talk about cat society, because contrary to what some people think, they're quite a social species. This video made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi! Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about a paper that came up in Rule 12 of the 12 Rules for Life series. And what better way to have a nice week than to talk about kitties? This paper focuses on clarifying the social relationships between cats when people aren't directly involved. Let's go through it. The domestic cat is a social species, both living indoors only or outdoors. And this goes for the pet cats who live outdoors, called free living in this paper, or feral cats. The caveat here is that there needs to be enough of a food supply in order to support the cat population. So if there's not really that much food around, then there's not going to be too many cats able to be in that area, and therefore not really much of a chance to socialize. A group of cats is called a colony, and there's enough friendships, rivalries, and hot pussy-on-pussy -pussy action to rival any telenovela. And the intricacies of their social network can impact access to resources or behaviors between the cats. The authors emphasize that understanding how cats act when left to their own devices in the absence of people is important for guiding the best practices and keeping these little fur balls in the home. Cat society is matrilineal, and the friendly relationships between female cats is the base of the social structure. It's argued that the possible food density for cats grew as people developed agriculture, making it possible for a larger group of cats to stay in one area. So, the existing mother-cat relationship was possibly adapted and expanded to incorporate larger numbers of cats, leading to a colony. But to reiterate, the colony size is tied to the food density. For cats, there's an important distinction between members of the colony and strangers. As with most social species, strangers aren't allowed open access to the group. So a stranger coming in will initially be met with aggression, but if they keep trying and play their little kitty cards right, they can become a member of the colony. Within a colony, any given cat will have relationships with the other members of the colony of varying strengths. And the strongest relationship is called a preferred associate, which is basically like a little kitty best friend. This is empirically defined as cats that are frequently found within one meter of each other at different times of day, in different locations, or activities. Interestingly, gender doesn't seem to factor into rates of best friending. This goes for free living, feral, fixed, not fixed, but there is a little bit of nuance here. In colonies with intact males, some males will be near each other significantly less often than colonies with purely neutered males, and it's suggested this is due to sexual competition between those males. Kitty best friends will commonly nose boop each other as a greeting, and this happens at the same rate for male or female cats with male or female friends. Similar to other social species, grooming between cats is a social bonding activity. In general, this behavior is called allo-grooming, and you can see where this would promote bonding. Another organism is helping you with a very basic self-care task and getting up in your personal bubble, and it can kind of be an intimate experience. In cats, this involves licking each other, typically on the head and neck. Purring is common. The cat being groomed will typically move its head around to give the one grooming access. Sometimes cats will approach other cats and assume the to-be-groomed position, essentially saying, hey, clean me. This tends to happen more between preferred associates. In addition to grooming, cats will aloe rub. If you've ever had a cat just get friendly with your leg, that's what was going on. This seems to accomplish a couple things. This allows for scents to be exchanged, and it probably feels good, as they purr when doing this. It's suggested that all this rubbing between colony members establishes a colony odor. Aloe rubbing will usually be preceded by the approaching cat holding their tail up in the sort of universal cat body language sign of, we're cool, right? We're cool. And aloe rubbing between paired associates may see them intertwining their tails as they're rubbing up against each other. Also in cat, an extended paw with the claws retracted, so not extended but in, means, I want to play. Can we play? And play within a colony is common. It can happen between members of any age and any gender, but peak play activity happens between four weeks old to four months old. 
And the reason I wanted to go into detail on this paper is because it talks about pillowing. This is when one cat uses another as a pillow, or plainly, when one cat sits or lays on top of another cat. It's noted this occurs even in hot weather, suggesting it isn't for body temperature purposes. Our calico would use Cleo as a pillow all the time, even when Cleo was a tiny kitten. This section focuses mostly on cooperative behaviors between female cats, which mostly revolves around kitten rearing and can even involve non-related cats. This starts with midwifing during the birth of a litter. So the helper cats can clean the rear of the birthing cat, clean the kittens up because, you know, they're kind of a gooey mess when they come out, and dispose of the birthing evidence, if you know what I mean. As the kittens grow, the helper cats may continue to help groom, feed, and protect those kittens. Intact males may fight with each other, particularly when there's an estrus female around. However, guy cats can still be super best friends with each other, doing all the grooming and rubbing that we talked about previously. They may also be super chill with a female in heat and just wait their turn, if you know what I'm saying. Speaking of kitty sex, the authors reiterate that males and females can do all the grooming and rubbing and still just be friends. But if mating does come into the picture, paired associates may get extra hot and heavy before doing the deed. There doesn't seem to be a mating dominance hierarchy per se. The more important deciding factor is the friendships and paired associates that any given male cat has with the possible female cats in the colony. In cats, the mom teaches the kittens how to hunt prey. And this starts by bringing them dead prey examples when they're four weeks old to sort of get familiar with how it feels and everything. And eventually they graduate to being brought live prey to them by their mom and then having to hunt it in their little nest area. It's noted that part of this learning is observational in nature. The kittens watch their mother hunt and how she does it before trying to do it themselves in a way similar to what they saw. And the ability of cats to learn things that aren't part of their natural skill set purely by watching others like humans open doors or whatever is highlighted. And the paper doesn't talk about this, but it does fit into many owners' experience who let their cats outside, where the cat brings back a partially dead or not very hurt prey item and turns it loose in the house, presumably for the owner to do something with. And it does seem to suggest that the cat does think that we are hopeless and need all the help we can get in learning how to hunt things because we clearly aren't. And while cats may be social in a lot of regards, hunting is pretty much a solitary activity. The prey items that the house cat goes after aren't big enough to be shared. So it doesn't really make sense for a whole group of them to get together to take down one little happy chirpy bird. You know, if they're going after a wildebeest, sure, but birds and frogs and lizards and whatever, that's it's best done alone. Cat moms are critical in modeling and shaping their kittens' behaviors. For example, the kitten's ability to interact and deal with people will largely be driven by how their mom does that behavior. So if the kitten's first interaction with people and the mom present, the mom is relaxed and fine, the kittens will be more sociable with people when they grow up than if the mom is tense or absent. Cat dads aren't completely out of the picture. They'll help defend the kittens from threats, share food, help with grooming, and even cuddle and curl around kittens who've been left alone at the colony site. And in a true dad move, they'll even separate fights between the younger cats. Related cats are the most familiar with each other, and other colony members coming in second, and then less familiar cats that aren't a part of the colony but still known coming in third. Small groups of cats may have a linear dominance hierarchy, like Cat A is dominant to Cat B, who's dominant to Cat C, and Cat A is also dominant to Cat C, it, linear. But when you get into larger groups of cats, the dominant submissive relationships between them gets a bit more complicated. There is some benefit for being higher up the kitty dominance hierarchy for access to resources, but even that's not straightforward. A coalition of what should be submissive cats can overrule a dominant cat and gain access to a resource. Or if we're talking about mating, the female's choice and who she's friends with comes into play more than the dominance hierarchy itself. 
but the authors explain that it's important to understand how these dominance hierarchies can sort of work to help figure out how relationships between cats in a household work. In a group of cats, body language rituals tend to be used to acknowledge dominant or submissive status between cats rather than fighting every time. Generally, dominant cats are given right-of-way in walking paths or access to the best perches or whatever, and failing that, if a submissive cat can't get out of the way fast enough, they'll kind of avert their gaze almost reverently from the dominant cat. And if that doesn't work, they'll flop on their side and just, I'm not a threat. Dominant cat displays include intense staring at the submissive, a rigid body posture, including the tail which is flopped over at the tip for some reason, and it's noted that usually the intense stare is enough to get the submissive cat to do whatever, leave the walking path, get off the warm spot, just do what the dominant cat wants. While the dominant cat may have priority in things like food access, they might not act on it. it sort of depends on the personality of the cat. And the authors speculate that part of why there's not the rigid dominance hierarchy for mating is again because of the importance of female choice in who she's going to pair up with. Speaking of personality, the differences between individual cats in personality and temperament is touched on, with the authors noting that there can be differences between dominant cats in how much they take advantage of their position. Some won't really act on it. And some are the little kitty petty tyrants of the world and will bully other cats in their colony. Unfortunately, what makes a cat a bully isn't fully understood. They suggest maybe it has to do with socialization. But it sucks that it's not better understood because having a bully cat can really disrupt the other cats and even dogs in your house. Case in point, growing up, we had two cats, one of which was mine, and things were cool. Then my mom got another cat from a work friend, and that cat was a piece of shit. It terrorized my cat. I think it got put in its place by the other cat in the household, but it got to the point where my cat wouldn't leave my room. Uh, and the balance was somewhat restored when we took in another stray, who was very fond of my cat and would kick the shit out of the little asshole. So yes, I have experience with little kitty bullies, and it sucks. However, I am not saying that adding cats to a bad relationship between existing cats will fix things. We were lucky it worked out that way. Uh, there's certainly other behaviors to address between the cats before adding another cat to the equation. Cats are one of the most vocal carnivore species, and there's roughly three categories of vocalizations. First, mouth closed sounds. This includes purring and the little chirpy trill sound. Second, mouth open, then gradually closing. This is described as various types of meows, said to other cats, dogs, or people. Third, mouth held open. These tend to be related to aggressive behaviors and include things like growling, hissing, or spitting. The sebaceous glands are the primary thing for olfactory communication, particularly around their head, butts, and between their digits. Glands in or around the face distribute scent when the cat rubs its head on something. Other bodily secretions can be used to communicate as well. Urine marking is apparently not well understood. The idea that it's used as a territorial marking has been disputed, and it's instead thought it's used to communicate a couple different things. Things like, this kitty was here, all the way to, hey, I'm female and I'm DTF. That feral cats will tend to bury their poop when they are in the center of their range and do it less often at the ends of their range is also not fully understood. Again, this idea that it's a territorial marking doesn't really seem to hold water because cats will smell the unburied poop and then just keep walking. It's not something that really deters them. So instead, the author suggests that maybe it's just a hygiene issue that you take care of close to home and when you're further off, meh the cat version of don't shit where you eat? Because cats are a social species, they need to learn many behaviors from other cats. So if you have a cat who's raised in relative isolation from other cats for a good chunk of its life, it won't have learned how to cat properly. 
And if it's later introduced to cats, like if you get other cats at some later point, there may be excessive fear or aggression from miscommunication between the cats who can speak cat and the cat who doesn't really understand it. The authors note the stability of a colony's makeup and the response to stranger cats, and caution that this is something we need to understand as owners if we're trying to bring a new cat into an existing cat mix. As such, they have a couple suggestions. First, they suggest trying to adopt cats in small established groups, like two or three cats who are either related or attached to each other, instead of bringing in a single cat when you want a new cat. And related to that, Izzy, initially when she was adopted out before we had her, she was adopted out with her brother, as a pair. And whoever had adopted her decided that they only wanted one cat, and so sent Izzy back into the foster system. And that pretty much broke my heart when this was told to me. And it's not like the foster lady was trying to manipulate me. This was after we were, you know, sold on having Izzy as part of our family, and I'm signing the paperwork to make it official as the lady's telling me this. So it wasn't really emotional blackmail, but it was still part of her story. And, you know, I'm glad she's home here. Second, when bringing a stranger cat in, give their scents time to mingle, so it's sort of like a new colony scent. And this can be accomplished in a couple ways. For one, you can have them rotate in the rooms that they get to be in as you're getting the scent mingling happening. Also, you can work on gradually introducing them to each other. So first, a door between them and they can do the little paw sniff thing, and then between a screen door, and then eventually they get full access to each other. Cats rubbing on us are a sign of affection, and us giving them head scratches, we're essentially aloe grooming them. We're doing the thing that the other kitties would do just without all the cat hair in our mouth. But if a cat isn't really receptive to being scratched beyond its head and neck, remember that aloe grooming between cats tends to just be in the head and neck area, and so this is behavior that might not be part of something it's comfortable with. Cats are allowed to have boundaries too. The hierarchical structure of cats in your household may be useful to think about and examine if there's some strife there. If there's a lot of aggression, particularly from one cat, you may have a poorly socialized animal in your mix. If you have a dominant and knows it cat, the authors suggest that you might be able to reduce some of the strife by acting in accordance with that status. What this works out to is feeding them first, making sure that they have the nicest place on the scratching pole, you know, giving them the best things first for them to do with as they please before the other cats. It's also included that you should make sure that you've got enough water sources and litter boxes and other vital resources that one cat can't monopolize it from the other ones. So in closing, cats are social little fur balls, and understanding how they interact with each other can improve our ability to keep them around as friends. And that's it for this video. See you guys next time. Bye.